Hello, and welcome to Spicy Toast Gaming. Thank you for tuning in to another Spicy Toast Gaming video. In today's video, we're going to be covering the best relic combinations for each champion. If you enjoy the video, please like and subscribe, and let's get into it. To start off, I wanna say that this is just going to be the best relic combination for each champion. I'm not going to go into every relic saying which ones are good on a champion, just the best combination for being able to win the game uh, efficiently. If you want a more detailed breakdown, I have guides for every single champion on the channel, so just uh, search for those and you'll be able to get a more detailed breakdown of what relics work in general for the whole champion. There's a lot of champions here and we're going to try to get through this um, as fast as possible while still giving you a good breakdown of this build for each one. Up first we have Aatrox with the Grand General's Counter Plan, the Berserker's Buckle, and the Scourge's Stash. The Grand General Counter Plan, Round Star, create a fleeting copy of me in hand. We're using that to get the Deathbringer Sweep, which goes into the Slash, and then the Descent. Each one of these is Aatrox and enemy strike each other. So that's able to scale up Aatrox very high with the Berserker's Buckle. Every time I survive damage, grant me 2-2. Two, two. Very, very nice. And the Scourge of Stash, Plunder, I cost 2 less. We're trying to cheat Aatrox out early so he can start getting the Grand General's Counterplan up and running, getting you all of those strikes. Those strikes are very good. One for his star power. When equipped, ally strikes reduce the cost of a random card in hand by 2. He's getting up to 3 strikes every single round, potentially more with attacking and blocking. Very, very strong. Also, when you strike, heal your next is two and then you also have a world ender you need this to level up Aatrox and essentially end the game reduce my cost by one each time each time an equip ally or dark instruct this game so you have ton of synergy with striking and that is what this whole build is built around giving you ton of sustain cost reduction and helping you to level up and scale Aatrox next we have Annie we're running Archangel Staff refill your spell mana Ludens Tempest all of your spells and skills deal one extra damage and again the Grand General's counter plan round star create a fleeting copy of me in hand Archangel staff is very nice you have a lot of spells since you're one cost and will be on the board pretty much every single round giving you great benefit for archangels loot and tempests it's already the same as your star powers so you're just increasing that to your spells and skills deal three damage as long as annie's on the board because ludens only activates if annie's actually on the board the grand general's counter plan this is great both for survivability but also giving you more damage and draw so her champion spell is annie's disintegrate if we take a look at the starting deck it's the same as right here, so it only costs one, which you'll always have mana for because of your Archangels. Pick a unit the next time it takes one damage this round, kill it. This gives you excellent removal, but it also gives you that safety net of just in case something kills Annie, you have this fleeting copy that you can save in your hand to play her again for one cost uh, and keep her alive, essentially. Even though she died, you have that extra copy. Up next is Ash with, again, the Grand General's Counter Plan, Archangel's Staff, and the Troll King's Crown. So the Grand General's Counter Plan, that gives you... Ash's Frostbite. If we take a look at the starting deck, we see that her Frostbite, Flash Freeze, also gets Hextech Fabricator. So giving you more control with Frostbite and your enemies, helping uh, Ash level up, and then also giving your strongest unit, which will normally be Ash, an additional item. So very strong, always good to have more of these created, and then that's shuffling more copies of Ash into your deck. Archangel Staff, this is so you always have the mana to play the uh, Frostbite that you are generating. And then Troll King's Crown, giving you Overwhelm, always a good power to have, but it is also important for Ash because we have Avarosian Spirit. When an ally kills a unit with zero power, grant your ally 1-1. One, one. So you want your units to actually be grabbing those Frostbitten units and killing them, but you don't want all of their damage to be lost. So having Overwhelm on all your allies lets you kill those units with that zero power, but then also give damage to the enemy Nexus. Great way to scale up your unit without losing too much damage. Up next, we have Bard with Corrupted Star Fragment, Berserker's Buckle, and the Troll King's Crown. First, we need to take a look at one of his star powers. When you summon an ally with buff stats, grant it two random keywords. So you're going to be having a lot of units with buff stats and a lot of keywords. Corrupted Star Fragment lets you consolidate all of those onto Bard, making him incredibly powerful, but also this tributes to your win condition of you've increased the total stats of allies in play or hand by 20. This helps you level up Bard much faster. Same with Berserker Buckle. Great that it's buffing up Bard. Also contributing to his level up. Level up, very powerful. Troll King's Crown. Allies have Overwhelm. You're going to be seeing this on a lot of cards throughout this video, really helping you just end the game as fast as possible, especially for Bard having so many large units. You want them to be able to use that damage to actually destroy the Nexus and not just get blocked out. Up next, we have Darius with the Scourge 
Righteous Stash, the Curator's Gatebreaker, and Crown Guard Inheritance for that third rare slot. So you're trying to get him out for as cheap as possible. You have a lot of Overwhelm units, so getting that Blunder effect activated shouldn't be too difficult. The Gatebreaker, either to help finish off the game, or just do a large chunk of damage to the enemy Nexus, and then Crown Guard Inheritance to help close out the game. Darius is your finisher, you're using him to finish off the enemy Nexus. You have a very aggro deck, and that's the playstyle you're trying to fulfill here. Up next, we have Diana with Gale Force, Troll King's Crown, and Bounty Hunter's Renown. Gale Force letting you attack twice in a single round, very nice. Troll King's Crown, allies have Overwhelm. Now this is purely for Diana, so uh, part for star powers, allies have Nightfall grant me two power, and if they have Quick Attack, give them double attack instead. Diana has Quick Attack, this gives her double attack. Overwhelm is incredibly important if you have double attack, because if you do not have Overwhelm, then if you get blocked out by a unit, you might kill them with your first attack, and then your second attack fizzles, you're losing tons of damage, you need to have Overwhelm if you have a double attack unit. And then Bounty Hunter's Renown, this just gives you a good amount of stats, both improving your survivability as well as your damage, giving you more likely the chance to get a OTK with Diana, which is what she is best at. Next, let's take a look at Evelyn. Very simple, we have Tempest Blade, Crown Guard Inheritance, and Deceiver's Crest. Evelyn is able to level up up to six times in a match, so these are all the relics that trigger with level up. So when you level up, stun all enemy units, when you level up, rally, and then when you level up, create a copy of the champion spell in hand, it costs zero this round, which is right here. Stop all enemy spells and skills targeting Evelyn, and she strikes an enemy. So it counts as both removal and also safety for Evelyn. Very simple, very straightforward, very strong. Up next, we have Gnar. So we go with the Scourge's Stash, Dreadway Chase Guns, and then for the third slot, I'd put in a Bounty Hunter's Renown. Gnar, by default, has pretty weak stats, so having something that can scale up throughout an adventure will be very helpful for those stats. He's a little expensive at the four costs, so the Plunder, you're trying to already hit the enemy Nexus every single round, so you should be able to get this off, getting him out for two mana, very nice. Again, since you're trying to hit that enemy Nexus every single round, having two warning shots in hand that you can play on those rounds you normally wouldn't be able to will be very nice to uh, continue that stacking impact that you're trying to do. Up next, we're taking a look at Gwen with Crown Guard Inheritance, Ludin's Tempest, and the Troll King's Crown. The way this build works is you attack with Gwen as soon as you have her on the board. She will level up almost guaranteed. When you level up, you rally, you attack again, and you end the game. Very simple. If you need a detailed breakdown as to how that all happens, definitely go check out my Gwen guide. Up next, we have Alawi with Green Glade Shade Leaf, Crown Guard Inheritance, and Banshee's Veil for the Spell Shield. I think I would personally go with the Banshee's Veil, but if you don't like Spell Shield, uh, Berserker's Buckle and Bounty Hunter's Down also would work in this slot. The point of this build is Alawi has Overwhelm, your Tentacle does not. This way you can attack with Alawi, getting all the stats of the Tentacle, doing massive damage with your Overwhelm, and then your Tentacle has Elusive so they can slip past the enemy and still hit the Nexus. You're almost guaranteed to level up when you attack the first time with Alawi. That way you're getting your Crown Guard Inheritance, you can immediately attack again and end the game. Works out fairly similar to Gwen, but in a slightly different way. Up next, we have Jax with the same build as Diana, Gale Force, Troll King's Crown, and the Bounty Hunter's Renown. Now Jax does get overwhelmed when he levels up, but normally you are going to get blocked for your first attack, and so you want to be using all of your excess damage to still hit the enemy Nexus. The Troll King's Crown is normally going to make the difference between getting a OTK or a win in the first round and not. So this build lets Jack end the game normally in the first round. Next we're going to take a look at Jin, but first we need to touch on his star powers. So for every fourth fast spell, slow spell or skill, you play create a zero cost captive audience in hand. That is this right here, deal three to an enemy or stun it. And then setting the stage, when an ally plays a skill, grant them one one. For relics, we're going with Ludin's Tempest, all of your spells and skills deal one extra damage. Riptide Battery, Blunder, play Cannon Barrage, this right here, tutor unit or one to the Nexus, a uh, number of times equal to my cost. So this is going to happen four times. And then for the last one, it's the Crown Guard Inheritance when I level up Rally. Why this is so good, all of these count as a skill for Jin, so it's granting him four four from his star powers, it's also creating that captive audience, and it is very likely to level him up, which is then going to let him rally and end the game. Next, let's look at Jinx, and again, we're first going to touch on her star powers. When you play or discard a card, deal one to the enemy Nexus and one to a random enemy, and then wreak havoc when you level up a champion, create a super mega death rocket in hand. Now for relics, we're going with Dreadway Chase Gun. When I'm summoned, create two warning shots, the loose cannon's payload. When I'm summoned, discard your hand and then create that many pow pows. That's this right here. And then the curator's gatebreaker. When I'm summoned, I strike the enemy Nexus. 
Now the order that these are in is important. So when you play Jinx, first it's going to create two Dreadway Chase Guns in your hand. Then the Loose Cannons Payload is going to discard your entire hand, including those Chase Guns, dealing damage to the enemy Nexus as well as the enemy unit because of your star powers that you're discarding all of those cards. Jinx will then level up because I see your hand is empty from the Loose Cannons Payload. Then when she levels up, she will hit the enemy Nexus with the Gatebreaker doing a little bit extra damage since she is leveled. Normally what this is going to do is it's just going to kill the enemy nexus when you play Jinx. Up next we have Kaisa with the Blade Rack, Troll King's Crown, and Ludens Tempest. The one star power that matters here is allies with three or more positive keywords have 2-2. Two, two. Since you're giving all of your allies two positive keywords, most of them are going to hit that mark, giving those units all 2-2. Two, two. This also essentially guarantees that Kaisa will be evolved when you play her, or trigger that evolution, which, which means all of your evolved units are going to get an additional 2-2. Two, two. And then Ludens Tempest is important because Kaisa has a skill that when she was leveled up, she deals this. Deal one for each positive keyword Kaisa has to enemies or the enemy nexus. She does this when she's leveled up and attacks. So Ludinus Tempest is essentially doubling the amount of damage of that attack. Very powerful. Up next we have Kane with Stalker's Blade, Curator's Gatebreaker, and the Bounty Hunter's Renown. Now these two are important because his level up I've struck twice. When I level up Recall Me, when he gets recalled he becomes this zero cost version. So you can play him for zero cost and then choose if he becomes Ross or the Shadow Assassin. The important thing though is when you play him again, both of these effects trigger a second time. So very nice, you're getting more of like essentially a doubling benefit compared to most champions. Bounty Hunter's Renown, you have pretty weak stats at the start of the game, especially that weak attack. So being able to make sure that these actually do more damage is quite nice. With Stalker's Blade, if you're able to kill an enemy unit, you're going to be getting a 2-2 buff. Very good for starting your scaling and helping Kane be the powerhouse to end the game. Up next, we have LeBlanc, the best champion of the game. Uh, for her, the build I'm currently running is Gale Force, Gatebreaker, and Stalker's Blade. But honestly, if you had like three Gatebreakers or any combination of three of these, I would probably be best. The reason that is with your level two, when you've leveled up a champion this game, when allies attack, summon a attacking ephemeral LeBlanc. With LeBlanc, she has five power and she levels up when you dealt 15 damage. So if you're able to play her and immediately level her up, that is going to be very strong because then every time you attack, she'll be summoned again and all of these effects will trigger again. Now, when she levels up, every time I see you deal 15 damage, create a mirror image in hand. If you already have one, reduce its cost by one. So with the mirror image, summon an exact ephemeral copy of an ally with five plus power. You're able to use this to summon LeBlanc more, triggering all of these effects again. So you want to stack as many Gatebreakers or Stalker's Blade as possible. Gale Force also works because you can attack twice and then get recalled to summon the unit again and just keep destroying the Nexus. Up next, we have Leona, but we need to touch on her star powers first. So allies have Daybreak, or when you activate another Daybreak, grant me 1-1. One, one. And then when you level up a ally champion, create a Morning Light in hand, it costs zero. Morning Light, give allies 1-1 one, one this round, activate an ally's Daybreak effect. So when you activate that, you're also granting all of your allies 1-1 one, one from your first star power. If we take a look at Relics, we're going with the Grand General's Counter Plan, Archangel Staff, and then for the third slot, we are going with the Troll King's Crown. Grand General's Counter Plan, the Fleeting Copy is going to be turned into the Morning Light. Again, give allies 1-1, one, one, activate a allies Daybreak effect. Leona is normally going to be leveled up when you play her, and so Daybreak, or when you activate another Daybreak, stun the strongest enemy. So your Morning Light, when you play it, is going to be stunning the strongest enemy, and then giving all of your units a 2-2 two, two buff from this, as well as the Star Powers. And then all of your units with their massive buffs have Overwhelm, so you're able to end the game shortly thereafter. Up next, we have Lux, but first we need to touch on her star powers. So we have each round, the first time you play a spell, refill mana equal to its cost. When you play six or more mana of spells, create a zero cost golden aegis in hand. Give an ally barrier this round, then rally. For relics, we're going with the Scourge's Stash, Archangel Staff, and Arcane Comet. We're trying to get Lux on the board for three mana early. When she's on the board, each round she's going to be refilling our spell mana and creating a Falling Comet. So six cost slow, obliterate a unit or landmark. Since this is six cost, just playing that spell, the first time each round is going to refill its cost. It's going to create a Golden Aegis, and then it's going to level up Lux, and if she's already leveled, it's going to be triggering a Final Spark each time. So giving you a large amount of removal and damage, really helping you end and control the game in the next couple rounds. Next we have Master Yi, and again we just need to briefly touch on his star powers. So for one, when you play a non-fleeting spell, create a one cost twin disciples or twin disciplines in hand so just a combat trick giving you 
power or health, and then round start flow, grant allies 1-1, one, one. so the power, round start flow, give your strongest ally elusive. For Master Yi himself, every single round, flow, grant allied Master Yi's everywhere the 2 power, so you wanted to do 2 spells every single round to trigger your flow. For that, we're going with Archangel Staff, the Grand General's Counter Plan, and Crown Guard Inheritance. The important part is the Counter Plan. We're going to make his Champion spell, which when you play it, it then generates uh, another spell. So you always are going to have at least two spells to trigger your flow, but the important part is his champion spell is the Wuju style, which if you take a look at the starting deck, also has the Hero's Horn. So you're going to be drawing another champion each time. Since you're mostly just going to have Yi in your deck, it's very likely to just draw another Master Yi, thereby being an infinite cycle. Because of that, with the Crown Guards, you can buff Master Yi to a very high level, and even though they're temporary stats, you can buff up his damage, attack, or block, level up by dealing 12 damage, rally, and then end the game. Up next we have Misfortune with Luden's Tempest, the Grand General's Counterplan, and Archangel's Staff. So Luden Tempest, all of your spells and skills deal one extra damage. That is important because Misfortune, when she attacks, she either does bullet time or double tap. So double tap, deal one to all battling enemies in the enemy nexus. Bullet time, deal one to deal one damage three times to all battling enemies in the enemy nexus. And then her champion spell, deal one to three different random enemies and the enemy nexus. So these are all dealing one damage. Some of them, like this, is doing it three times, whereas Make It Rain is doing one damage to three different targets. So essentially, Luden's Tempest, since it's adding one damage, is actually doubling the effect of all of those, which adds up quite nice. The Grand General's Counter Plan is making that double time. Turns out to be pretty good removal. And then Archangel Staff, round start, refill your spell mana, just so you always have mana for the counter plan. If we're looking at her starting deck, the Make It Rain also has the Hex Tech Fabricator, so you're also giving items to your units, which can be quite helpful. Up next, we have Nasus, and it's quite simple to me. I would go with Curator's Gatebreaker and then double Bounty Hunter's Renown. Uh, we're doing this because we want Nasus to close out the game for us, and we also want to guarantee that he's going to strike for 10 damage as soon as he is played on the board. Uh, that way, when he is played, he levels up, gets a Spell Shield, and then also has the added effect of enemies have negative one power. We're really hoping that Nasus will close out the game uh, when we play him for that six mana. Up next we have Orn, and I'd go for Gale Force, Corrupted Star Fragment, as well as Gatebreaker. So the Gatebreaker is to make sure that he is leveled up when you play him, and then the Gale Force and Corrupted Star Fragment. Very powerful combination for Orn, because Orn, when he levels up, attack, forge me twice, then summon a attacking Spirit of the Ram with my stats. So right here we see Spirit of the Ram, it has Overwhelm, but then it also has all the stats of Orn. So however big Orn is, the Ram will then also grow to that size, but then you're immediately consuming it, essentially just doubling up all your stats on Orn, as well as giving him Overwhelm. Then, if the Nexus still isn't dead, since you're a scout, you can attack again, doubling all of your stats a second time, pretty much guaranteeing that the enemy Nexus will be dead if you've gotten to this point of the game. Up next, we have Pike with Gatebreaker, Stalker's Blade, and Bounty Hunter's Renown. The goal is to try to get your Pike leveled up as soon as possible. Also, it is in this order for a reason. That way, you'll hit the enemy Nexus first, hopefully level up, and then your Stalker's Blade will hit, kill an enemy, and then you will start your rampage and board wipe. So Pike, when he levels up after dealing 15 plus damage, now when he kills an enemy, he strikes the next weakest enemy, and if he kills it, this will just keep chaining, so Pike can essentially clear the entire enemy board. So that's why we're trying to do as much damage with Pike whenever we play him on the board, so that he levels up as soon as possible. He very much is your win condition um, once you're getting Pike to a higher level. Up next, we have Tom Kench with a pretty straightforward build. So the Berserker's Buckle, the Berserker's Buckle, and then Troll King's Crown. So every time Pike survives damage, he is going to be getting 6-6 six, six because he also has Glutton for Punishment when an ally survives damage, granted 2-2. Two, two. So you essentially have Berserker's Buckle three times, and with Tom Kench, if he's um, on the board, he is going to be creating an Acquired Taste. Tom Kench swallows an enemy unit, it strikes him, then he captures it. So you have a guaranteed way to get an enemy unit to strike you, thereby starting your scaling. And then the Troll King's Crown is just making sure you're using all all of those extra stats to destroy the enemy nexus. Up next we have Talia, but first we're going to touch on her star powers. So uh, game starts, summon a hibernating rock bear, allies have 1-1 one, one, and overwhelm, and then when an allied landmark is destroyed, grant allies 1 power. So your allies all getting buffed up and then also having overwhelm. For her relics we're going with the Scourge's Stash, Corrupted Star Fragment, and the Bounty Hunter's Renown. Scourge's Stash, trying to get her out um, earlier, she's a little bit too expensive for that 5 cost. Corrupted Star Fragment, your board is normally pretty 
pretty full, so trying to consolidate those stats onto Talia and then using her to end the game. And then Bounty Hunter's Renown, again, just trying to scale up your Talia so that she can end the game as fast as possible. You really get outpaced by most other decks, so you really need to try to win in the mid game, otherwise you're probably going to have a rough time. So this whole setup, just trying to push you towards winning the game as fast as possible. Next, we have Teemo with Gale Force, Gatebreaker, and Bounty Hunter's Renown. If you have double Gatebreaker, run that here because they both count as Nexus Strike. So you see here at Nexus Strike, plant five Puff Cap on random cards in the enemy deck. And then if Teemo levels up, his Nexus Strike doubles the Poison Puff Caps in the enemy deck. You're trying to get as many Nexus Strikes off as possible. Gale Force helps that with both recalling you every round, so that can be played and your Gatebreakers can go off again every single round. But then also you can attack twice and try to double those Puff Caps. Your one star power that really matters here is when allies attack, plant 10 Poison Puff Caps on random cards in the enemy deck. So also with attacking twice, again, putting more Puff Caps in there. Now I will say the Bounty Hunter's Renown does help out quite a lot with all of your attacks and Nexus Strike. Quite often you're doing more damage with Teemo just hitting the enemy Nexus than the actual Puff Caps themselves, but they're also a great way to help finish off the enemy in the first couple rounds. Next up we have Varus with Archangel Staff, Him of Valor, and then I'd actually put on a Spell Shield here. With Him of Valor you're really buffing up your Varus to make him as powerful as possible, so you don't want him to get vengeance or something like that taken off the board. So the Spell Shield is actually quite valuable there for that third slot. So Archangel Staff, you know what that does. Him of Valor, when I'm summoned, create Redoubled Valor. Fully heal an ally, then double its powers and health. This is very good for Varus because it's one star power. When you target an ally with a single target spell, copy it on your strongest ally. So you just make sure that Varus is your strongest ally. Then you play Him of Valor on him, doubling his stats up twice, essentially making him absolutely massive. And then he then ends the game. When he levels up, he gets overwhelmed. So you don't really need to worry about all that damage going to waste. Play Varus, play Redoubled Valor, end the game. Up next, we have Vayne with Troll King's Crown, Bounty Hunter's Renown, and Berserker's Buckle. Vayne has been hit with quite a lot of nerfs over the past little while, and so she really needs help with the Bounty, Hunt Bounty Hunter's Renown and Berserker's Buckle uh, to increase her power. Since you're just at 3-3 three, three, that's being played for 3 mana, when you're going against some of the tougher targets, you're probably going to die in your first couple rounds, so you really need the help here to increase your scaling. And then Overwhelm just to try to end the game as soon as possible. Since you're attacking so many times with Vayne, you're really susceptible to just getting blocked out and none of your damage actually going through, through to the enemy Nexus, so Overwhelm really feels uh, necessary in my opinion. Up next we have Vagar, uh, Luden's Tempest, the Scourge's Stash, and Banshee's Veil. So Luden's Tempest, all of your spells and skills deal one extra damage, and the whole point of Vagar is increasing the damage of your darkness and using that to end the game. Scourge's Stash, you're trying to get Vagar on the board as soon as possible so we can start scaling up your uh, darkness. And then Banshee's Veil, Vagar is your win condition, you need to stay on the board and stay safe so that he can level up and destroy the enemy nexus. Next up is Vi with Gale Force, Gatebreaker, and I'd actually put a, another Gatebreaker here, uh, or you could put a Bounty Hunter's Renown because we know how great uh, that is. So the point of this, Vi, she's seen in your hand, she's scaling up up to um, 10 damage, and then if she strikes, she will level up. So she gets her full power, and then when I strike a unit when attacking, deal 5 to the enemy nexus. So Gale Force, this is so that when you play her, your Gatebreaker goes off, she levels up, and then you can attack twice. If for some reason the nexus is still alive, which it hopefully shouldn't be, she will be leveled up, so she'll strike again for her full damage. Now with this, you have to be sure that she is going to hit for the 10 damage. If she doesn't, then when she gets recalled, she's going to reset back to her 2-4 state, but you don't want that happening. Um, but yeah, you just have Vice in your hand, scaling up, you play her, then with this combination, you're able to end the game. Up next, we have Yasuo with Tempest Blade, Crown Guard Inheritance, and Banshee's Veil. Much like Vagar, you want Yasuo to be able to sit on the board and be protected. He is your win condition, uh, but what normally happens is Yasuo will level up either the rounds you play him or like one or two rounds after. When he levels up, he stuns all enemies and then rallies. When they're all stunned, Yasuo will strike each one of them, normally killing them, but also with the star powers. When an ally strikes, grant them one power. So he's getting stronger and stronger with all the strikes, and then you can rally and normally end the game. If the game's not over, normally it will be shortly thereafter as Yasuo is just sitting on your board taking out an enemy unit every single round since every round you're stunning the strongest enemy and Yasuo is going to strike them. Up next we have Yumi and Yumi is an interesting one. Generally any text on the item doesn't work, uh, just the keywords and stats. Now I did just test out the Bounty Hunter's Renown and it does actually work to buff up the card you are attaching to. So for 
or Yumi, I'd go with Gale Force, Bounty Hunters Renown, and then either Duelist or another Bounty Hunters Renown. So Duelist is very important, letting you have some removal, removal and take out enemy threats with your attacks. Also making sure that uh, you're not dying when you're attacking. But if you just want to go for a massive amount of stats, then you can go with Double Bounty Hunters Renown and Gale Force. So whatever unit you're attaching to, it's going to get a bunch of stats, scout, and be able to uh, carry the game for you. Up next we have Echo, and I would go with Corrupted Star Fragment, the Scourge's Stash, and then the Grand General's Counterplan. Now Echo can be fairly weak, but he's also your win condition, so you want to get him on the board as soon as possible and scaling up with the Corrupted Star Fragment. Now the Grand General's Counterplan works very well because that gives you a called shot, which when you cast it, draw one, create a parallel convergence in your deck. Parallel convergence right here, start a free attack with an exact ephemeral copy of each ally. Very strong spell, this will really help you win a lot of your games, so creating one of these every round to shuffle a Parallel Convergence into your deck will be very nice. But this is not only shuffling in a Parallel Convergence, it is also creating an Echo in your deck, which if you draw another Echo, it's going to give you a Time Trick Predict and then draw one. Very strong because your entire build is built around predicting or your entire champion. Very strong card, but I'm going to put this in last as I need the Corrupted Star Fragment and Scourge's Stash to help your Echo get on the board and scale up as fast as possible. Up next, we have Garen. And for Garen, I like to go Stalker's Blade, Gatebreaker, and then Crown Guard Inheritance. This way, when you play Garen, he strikes twice, immediately levels up, you rally, and then you try to end the game. If the game is not over, since Garen is leveled up, he will then rally every single round, and you're normally going to be able to end the game shortly thereafter. Next up, we have Kindred. Much like Echo, I like to go with the Scourge's Stash, Corrupted Star Fragment, and Banshee's Veil. Vale. This way, we're getting Kindred on the board earlier, and we're helping to get her to start scaling. And Banshee's Veil vale is just for the added protection. So Kindred, each time that uh, you slay a unit, she marks the weakest enemy. The Corrupted Star Fragment, that can count as a slay effect. So you can do this, you're killing your own ally, and then you're marking the weakest enemy. So an added bonus for Kindred, but also you want her on the board as soon as possible. That way she levels up uh, sooner and can start her scaling. So level up, I've seen you slay two units with my mark. So this is going to take at least two rounds to happen. And then you can level up and now she's going to get 2-2 every time you slay a unit each round, essentially. Uh, so very strong and you want to get this scaling started as soon as possible. Final champion, Lee Sin. We have Riggle's Lantern, Dreadway Chase Gun, and Troll King's Crown. So Riggle's Lantern, that impact, very nice for Lee Sin because if he levels up, uh, Dragon Rage enemies that I challenge, an ally kicks an enemy into the Nexus, striking both, and then if the enemy survives, we'll call it, this strike also triggers uh, your stacking impact. And then the Troll King's Crown, this is so your attack doesn't fizzle once you have leveled up. So you kick the unit, either killing it or recalling it. If you have Overwhelm, you then can also attack, so your Riggle's Lantern triggers again. This is able to do absolutely massive damage. The Chase Gun is so that when you play him, you can level him up if he's not leveled already, but if he is leveled, then you're playing two spells to give him Challenger and Barrier. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. It took a lot of time and effort to record and edit this, so if you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe. As you see, there was a lot of relics that were used over again. I might do a video just breaking down kind of the best relics to use when you are maxed out. Again, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you have a great day.